If you have your Bibles this morning, uh, we're going to be reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. We're going to be reading about, uh, Jesus is going to be talking about a man named John the Baptist. We've all heard of John the Baptist. We know who he was. He was not the guy that wrote the Gospel of John. Okay. There were two two different Johns. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And uh, he was sent to be the messenger that would come before the Messiah. And it says in chapter 11, starting at verse 1, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And we need to stop there and think about what that says. John the Baptist was in prison. He didn't start out in prison. In fact, if you read the Gospels, John was born of an old woman named Elizabeth who was well past childbearing years, yet God miraculously allowed her to conceive. His father's name was Zacharias, who was a high priest. And John had one purpose in life. We talk about the purpose-driven life. He had one purpose in life. His purpose was to announce the coming of the Messiah. He, when the time was right, I, I've said this before, and, and those of you that have, you know, been coming here for a while have heard me say this. The Jews had not heard from God for 400 years. 400 years without a prophecy. 400 years without a visitation. 400 years without a message from God. They had teachers, and they had Pharisees, and they had those who would expound upon the law and so forth. But they had not heard a word from God for 400 years. That's a long time. All of a sudden, this guy named John came out of nowhere, seemingly, and began preaching in the wilderness. You've heard me say this before. He did not go to Jerusalem. He did not go to the temple. He did not go to the, to the religious center of their people. But he went in the wilderness. And he began proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And people began to flock out to hear him because they sensed and they realized that finally, after 400 years, here was somebody speaking the word of God. And he had one message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Change your mind. Get right. Get ready. Because the kingdom of God is at hand. He preached and he baptized for repentance of sins. And we know that Jesus went out to him to be baptized. And when Jesus went out there, he, John said, wait a minute, you should be baptizing me. He recognized God gave him the vision. He gave him the understanding that this Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Not the sins of the world. But the sin of the world. And... Jesus said, I've got to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness sake and so forth. And you read about that in the Gospels. And what had happened, well, turn with me, kind of put your finger there in Matthew chapter 11. And turn with me to the last recorded uh, words of John the Baptist over in the Gospel of John in chapter 3. We all know the Gospel of John chapter 3. That's the, the born again chapter. You must be born again. John chapter 3.16. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, and so forth. But if you look at verse 22 of John chapter 3. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And Jesus started baptizing people. And John also was baptizing in Enon, near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. 
Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with you beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. They're saying, hey, John, our numbers are kind of bleeding off here. Because everybody's going to Jesus now. John, what's up? You know, what's, what's happening here? Listen to what, G, what John had to say. John answered and said this. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. I, I, listen, you can't... If, if you want to get something from God, you've got to get it from God. You can't buy it. You can't learn it. You can't earn it. It's given. I was thinking, I was talking to Lynn before the service a little bit and about... You know how God blessed us our worship service last week. God gave that. Somebody didn't think that up. God gave that, okay? It says, nothing, you can, you can receive nothing except to be given Him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness. Now, this is John the Baptist speaking to his disciples. You bear me witness. I said, I told you, I'm not the Christ, but that I am sent before Him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which stands and bears and, and hears him, Rejoices greatly because of his bridegroom's voice. This my, uh, thus my joy, uh, therefore, is fulfilled. So John says, I, I announced his coming. I, I, I was sent here to announce his coming. Now my time, he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He that comes from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaks of, of the earth. He that comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no man receives his testimony. He that has received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him. In other words, John's saying, listen, he's the one. I'm ready to, to fade into the shadows to allow him to do the work that God called him to do. Now that's what John said, John the Baptist. He didn't realize, I don't, maybe he didn't realize what he was saying. Maybe he didn't fully understand when you're talking about decreasing. He didn't understand how the decrease was going to happen. He figured he'd just kind of fade back in the shadows and retire. But he didn't understand how the decrease was going to come. Now we know the story, and again if you read through the Gospels, here's the story. John the Baptist, after Jesus began baptizing, after Jesus began increasing, he approached King Herod, one of the Herods. There were a number of Herods in the Bible. Uh, the Herod that was there when Jesus was born, he had died, but he had sons and uh, relatives that took you know, leadership positions. So he approached King Herod, who had taken his brother's wife uh, as, a, uh, as a wife, and John the Baptist went up to him and said, you better repent because that's against God's law. King Herod was not happy to hear what John had to say. So he put him in prison. He shut him up. But wait a minute. John the Baptist, proclaiming the coming of the Lord, sent by God. Wait a minute. He's, he's in prison. And not only eventually what happened, we know what happened, is he was beheaded. Okay. But back over there in Matthew chapter 11... Just so you understand the setup here. So you understand what's the, the dynamics of what's going on here. Jesus, his ministry has begun, begun and John's ministry has, has waned. And he's locked up in a prison. Okay, and they didn't have air conditioning. It was not a nice place. Okay. Now when John now this is verse two back in Matthew chapter eleven. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And he said unto him, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? Wait a minute. John, we had just read that when John saw Jesus, he said, There's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He testified and confessed that he was not the Christ, but that Jesus was the Christ. So he did all those things. But when he found himself in prison, when he found himself in the place that he had, did not expect to be, he expected Jesus to come and establish the kingdom, and here a king has put him in jail. He sent two of his disciples and he said, Did I miss it? 
Have you ever felt that? Have I missed something? Have I missed... Did I, did I miss something along this road? This is not what I had expected. Did I miss something? He sent two of his disciples. And he said, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. And he begins to quote from Isaiah. And he begins to say, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Last week, last Sunday evening, we preached about the two men walking on the road to Emmaus. I always preach that Easter evening, because it's, you know. And, 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 and they, they told, they met Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and they didn't recognize him. I believe God kept them from recognizing Jesus. And they were downhearted. And Jesus said, why are you so downhearted? Well, he knew why they were downhearted. But he wanted to hear them say it. And they said, we had expected this Jesus to be the, the Messiah, the King. And he ended up being like a loser. They nailed him to a cross. Didn't meet our expectations. And Jesus began to expound to them the word. And basically he said to them, well, what did you expect? We talked last week how Jesus told His disciples over and over and over again, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to mistreat me, they're going to kill me, they're going to spit on me. Da, da. But they, they weren't listening. What do you expect? Now, listen to what Jesus says. In verse 7, And as they departed, as John's disciples departed to take that message back to John the Baptist before he was beheaded, Jesus began to say, it's interesting that Jesus made sure that John knew the truth before he gave his life. John died knowing that, yeah, he was, he was right. He, Jesus was the, was, was the man. Now listen to what Jesus begins to, to speak here. He asked the people, the multitudes, He said, what went you out into the wilderness to see? What did you expect? When you heard about this guy out in the wilderness preaching the kingdom of God, what did you expect to see? A reed shaken with the wind. That was an idiom from that time that meant, you know, they had reeds. If you ever saw reeds growing out of like a, a river or whatever, and they're very flimsy, and when the wind blows, it goes back like this. And Jesus was saying, What do you expect to see some wimp out there? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Somebody who was dressing good and looking good? And... You know, I'm sure that John the Baptist. If, 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 uh, if he had wanted to, Herod could have bought him off. I'm sure Herod, I don't know, this is just conjecture, but you know, Herod probably tried to buy him off, probably tried to shut him up. John could have been living good. Soft raiment, nice place to live. If he had just kept his mouth shut. A man clothed in soft raiment, Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? I say unto you, more than a prophet. I've preached this message so many times. What did we expect? When we came to Christ, what did we expect? It, I guess it all depends on what you heard. You know, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I think every one of us that has, a, has come to Christ or come to church or, or whatever has at one time, somebody told them something about Jesus. Some, somebody told them something about church. What did they tell you? Did they tell you that coming to Christ would mean you would never have a problem? Did they tell you that, you know, if you sow your thousand dollar seed, you know, everything's going to be fine? Did they tell you that, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to be powerful and live victorious lives? No. There's a lot of people that have mixed up expectations. God can do anything He wants. You know, recently we've been we've been you've been hearing about the disasters down in down south with these 300 tornadoes in in, a, in like a week or so. 300 tornadoes. I don't know what the, what the uh, death toll is. It, it, it's up over 300 now. It's horrible. I was watching one of the news programs, and and they said that there was a fellow sitting on what was left of his house just sitting there. And he said, 
they talk, went up to, the talk, to talk to the guy, and the guy said, God's showing us he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> that guy has faith. He's showing us, because, you know, when these things come, they don't just hit bad people. What would you expect? When the earth shakes, it doesn't just shake underneath the houses of people that deny who Jesus is. It's going to shake everywhere. I mean to do that. Okay. He said, but what went you out to see? I think the little thing came off. That's all right. I'll put it up here. A prophet? Verse 9. I say unto you more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare the way before thee. This, he was predicted in the last writing Old Testament prophet, Malachi. John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. He's not in the Old Testament, he's in the New, but he's the last Old Testament prophet. And Malachi, the very last prophetic book in the Old Testament, looks forward to his coming. He said, I'm, I'm, he, he's called the messenger that was sent before the Christ to prepare the way. John was preparing the way. And listen to what Jesus said about John the Baptist. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That means in, 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 in the sense of God's redemptive plan, all the people that God used throughout the Old Testament to speak His Word and to move, John was the greatest of all of them, better than Isaiah, better than Moses, better than Abraham, better than uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the prophets. Yet, Jesus is saying, listen, he who is least in the kingdom, we might not be better than John morally, but we know things that John never knew. We understand things. We've been given the complete Word of God. We understand things that, God, that, that, that John didn't understand. And we have the presence and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and every believer that God can use us in ways greater than He used John the Baptist. doesn't mean we're better than Him as, as people. But that means that we have the power to be used by God. As John prepared the way, we can proclaim the way. Now, Jesus said, 12, and from the days, verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It was like when John began to preach, the Jews went out into the wilderness. And it was almost like they were, they were so, so hungry for a word from God, they were pushing the way in. You know how violent, you know, home invasion. They wanted to invade the kingdom. They wanted to get in. They wanted to hear the word. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus only said that a few times. That means, means it's kind of important. If the Jews had received Jesus Christ as their Messiah at that point, John, would, uh, would, John the Baptist would have been counted as Elijah, who was predicted would come. Now we know that you know, when they came up to John, they said, Are you Elijah? He said, No. And we know that they did not receive Jesus Christ. They rejected Him. Elijah is yet to come. Okay, but listen, listen what he says about John. Or listen to what he says about the generation, those people. He says, verse 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? See, this is, what do you expect? What did the people of that time expect? The reason why Jesus was crucified it's because he did not meet their expectation as to who Messiah would be. The reason why I think a lot of people flirt with the gospel, flirt with Jesus for a little bit, flirt with church for a little bit, and things don't happen the way they think they ought to happen, and they go off and they say, well, we'll just try something else. They don't understand that God can do anything He wants. And when we come to Him, we come to Him on His terms, not ours. See, we want to come to Him on our terms. We want to lay out, you know... Well, Lord, this is what I want you to do for me. And when he doesn't do it the way we want him to, we kind of say, well, go look for something else. We'll buy another book. Listen to what Jesus says. Whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. 
and saying, we've piped unto you and you have not danced, and we have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. No, you, you don't want to play, Jesus, you don't want to play with us. You know, the scribes and the Pharisees and the, and the, and the, and the leaders of Judaism at that time, they, they didn't like Jesus because Jesus, Jesus didn't want to play with them. Jesus wasn't playing games. We all know what playing games is like, don't we? You ever try to play games with God? We play, we play games with one another. Head games, you know. <laughs> Anybody ever try to play a head game with you? I'm too old for that stuff. <laughs> I, I, it's another story. Jesus is saying, I'm not playing your game. John didn't play your game. He didn't check in. He didn't register with you. He didn't come in and make sure it was okay. He just started speaking God's Word. He said in verse 18, For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a devil. That John, he's nuts. He's out there, he's crazy. He's possessed. He's out there eating locusts and honey, dressed like a wild man. And I had people call me nuts when I got saved. I don't know about you. My dad said, what's wrong with you? Okay. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a devil. The son of man came, came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Listen, it doesn't matter. What Jesus is getting at here is, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you. It doesn't matter what the religious hierarchy, it doesn't matter what those who are in charge think. What matters is what this word says. God sent John to proclaim the way of Jesus. They said he was nuts. Jesus started coming, healing people, raising people from the dead, and he said he's nothing but a drunk. Because he, he dared to fellowship with sinners. God forbid that a sinner would walk into church. That's the way some folks think. See, I pray, I want sinners to walk into church. I just want to believe, not sinners anymore. <laughs> okay, but, but, but listen to what Jesus is saying. He's saying, what did you expect? What did you expect? What did you expect from Messiah? We want, we want God, we want Christ, we want Jesus to fill our, our requirement sheet. To meet our requirements. But that's not the way he works. Then began he, Jesus... To abrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. I wonder what Jesus is saying to the United States of America. The most blessed nation on the face of this earth. We have it so good here compared to other places. We've heard so much gospel preaching. There are Bibles. I mean, it's everywhere. Yet there's a famine of the hearing of the Word of God. The Word of God is everywhere. You've got Bibles everywhere. They're stacked up, collecting dust. But hearing it and believing it? I wonder what God will say to the United States of America when He comes into judgment in this nation for all the things that we've endured, all these tornadoes and the hurricanes and, and uh, uh, earthquakes and all this stuff going on, I wonder what God would say, have you not, the floods, have you not heard, have, have, I, have you not even considered that maybe there's a God in heaven who's trying to get your attention, who's trying to get you to repent of your sins and, and declare righteousness instead of sin? He said, Woe unto you, Chorazin, Bethsaida. If the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Do you know the Word of God, the Gospel goes forth in third world nations, people that don't know any better and they hear it and they believe and God does mighty wonderful things in places where they don't have all these other distractions. But we have all these things going on in the name of Jesus. And we wonder why we don't see miracles. We wonder why we don't sense God's presence sometimes. Because we're so caught up in so many other different things. 
But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than you. And you, Capernaum, which are exalted above heaven, shall be... This, Jesus was talking about his home, hometown, his home area. Yeah, you're exalted above heaven. You shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. The Sodomites would have believed. God help us. We've, we've hardened our hearts and we've blinded our eyes. America. Christian nation. Yeah, right. America. In God, we trust. There's a lot of things we might trust in. The God of this Bible isn't one of them. As a nation. Oh, there are individuals that, that do. There are, there are good churches and good pastors, good congregations that still trust in this word, that still preach this word, that still preach about the blood, that still preach about the cross. Yes, there are, there's a remnant. There's believers everywhere. But as a nation, as, listen, this whole world is, is, is going to hell. Why? Because generally mankind has turned his back on God. It's like we've built a big tower of Babel. In electronics, and we can understand each other. We've got one speech again. It's all ones and zeros, you know. Now listen to what Jesus said. I said all that to get here. At that, that time, Jesus answered, if you have yours, please hear this morning. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. I thank God that the gospel is not something that you need a college degree to understand. You don't even need a high school degree to understand it. You don't need, e even need to be out of first grade to understand it. These kids understand more about the gospel than we do. Sometimes. Because we try to tie it all up and tangle it up. we got all these doctrines and you know, all this stuff. But the kids, they just, believe, they just believe in Jesus. The little one would sit here at the, when they would have rehearsal for the, for, the, for, the, for the worship service here. And she would look and she would cry and say, that makes me sad. When she would see what they were doing to Jesus. Now we sit there as adults and we say, we understand. I thank God. I, 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 I want to be, be a fool for Jesus. I don't care if people think I'm smarter or intelligent. I really don't care. I used to. I used to want people to think I, was, I had a lot of smarts. I don't care. I don't care if they think I'm smart or whatever. I want to be a fool for Christ. I want to believe. I want to be like one of these little babes he talks about. Reveal them unto babe. Even so, Father, it seemed good in your sight. It says in Corinthians that God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. He's, he's chosen the things that the world rejects as being untenable. As That's what he uses to establish his word. That's what he uses to establish his church. Ignorant people that are willing to believe what God says. This is what he says. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. He, Jesus is in control of everything. And no man knows the Son but the Father, neither knows any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now listen to his invitation. That's our invitation this morning. I'm not giving an invitation, Jesus is. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Pharisees, the scribes, the leaders, they rejected him. They didn't want what he had to offer. They were so wrapped up in their power and their position that when Jesus came on the scene, he didn't want to play their game, and they said, no thanks, crucify him. Let's try to kill him. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to get Jesus out of your life? Have you ever, has, has, has Christ ever dealt with you about something? I'm talking to believers. And you try to say, Jesus, get, I'm, I'm not interested in that right now. And we find ourselves being burdened when we reject what Christ has to say. Jesus is saying this morning, 
as he said for all of eternity. Come unto me, you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. How many people here need rest? You've been restless. You've been tossing and turning. You've been broken inside. You've been angry. You've been resentful. You've been hurt. You've been whatever it might be. How many people here would, would say inside of themselves, I've been wrestling and turning and churning. I need, how many people need rest from God this morning? Jesus is saying, come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Too many of us, we've been pulling the yoke of the world. We've been trying to pull that yoke. We've, 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 we've joined ourselves with certain elements of the world and we're trying to pull along. You know what? Jesus says, forget that. Come to me. I have a yoke for you that's easy. He says, my yoke is easy. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest in your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to ask you this morning. You're laboring. You're laboring. Under a heavy yoke. A burden. Something you've been dragging along. Maybe for years. Believers. Christians. I look out. I know most of you. I think, I think you're all believers. If you're not, you need to be one. But. You've been pulling a yoke. You've had a weight on your back. Sometimes we think, listen, sometimes we think that burden that we're carrying is our cross. No. Jesus said, for any man take up his cross and follow me. Okay, the cross that he gives us isn't that stuff that we, that we dug up out of the world. Some of us are carrying a burden. And we've been laboring. And we've been weighed down. Jesus says, before we partake of the Lord's table, come to me. Come to me. I want to take a minute this morning. If you need to come to Him this morning, Sometimes we have altar call at our seats. Sometimes we call. I'm, I'm just, if you need to come to him this morning, if you've been laboring, maybe it's fear. Fear over very real situations. Some of us are facing some very real situations. Maybe you're laboring with fear. Maybe you have something inside of you. That, just, that you just can't let go. Something that burns and churns on the inside. You know what I'm talking about. We're just going to pray. You could stay where you're at, but I'd like to ask you to come. Just stand up in front as we pray before we take communion. If that would be you, won't you come? Won't you come? All who are thirsty, all who are weak, Come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. The pain and the sorrow will be all washed away. As Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Maybe you can maybe kind of stretch out here in front. I'm going to ask my wife to come and stand with me. Brother D. Roy, could you come up and stand? Come on, Brother D. Come on, Brother D. Brother Ayo, come on up. Stand with us as we pray. As we pray. Joe, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Thank you. Uh, Sean, kind of cut this mic off for while Joe's praying. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus.